So we are going to talk about the basics of how vectors work, because vectors are really the foundation of multivariable calculus. Now when we were looking at single variable calculus, a lot of times we wanted to look at something like a variable x, and the way that it changed over time, and we would do things like derivatives and integrals on this one variable. But when we look at vector calculus, a lot of times instead of just having one component, we're going to look at multiple components, for example x and y. And these aren't the x and y that we're familiar with, for example, in a 2D graph like this. These are two components that can act completely independently. And the way that we represent that these two components go together is using vector notation. In this course, we're going to use these angled brackets to denote that we're looking at a vector. So in this case, this is the vector x, y. x is our first component, and y is our second component. Now a lot of times when we have vectors like this, we like to represent them spatially because we can get a look at what exactly is going on. So in this case, we have a horizontal axis here and a vertical axis. We might think about the vector x, y as being an arrow that points from the origin to a particular point in space. In this case, the horizontal component here would be x, and the vertical component would be our y. Notice that we can change either of those without really worrying about what the other one is doing. So I can make a different vector, x, y, 2. Notice the x has stayed the same, but I've changed y to y, 2. Suddenly our new vector now looks like this, with the exact same x component, but a different y component. So we aren't as restricted when we're looking at vectors as we are with functions. Now right here we've been looking at vectors in two dimensions, but a lot of times we want to look at higher dimensions as well. So say instead of just looking at x and y, we had x, y, and a third component, z. So now we're going to have to look at three different dimensions. Now in order to represent this spatially, we're going to have to get a little more creative with how we draw on whiteboards. Typically, we've been looking at two-dimensional vectors in terms of a horizontal and a vertical axis. But if we are looking at three dimensions, we're going to need three axes as well. So I'm going to introduce a third axis that looks like this. Now, since we're drawing on a two-dimensional surface here, we can't just have a third axis that points out of the board, even though that would make the most sense. But instead, we're going to look at this 2D drawing in terms of a sort of three-dimensional corner. Now when we think about what's going on in this diagram, we have two dimensions that look like this, and one dimension that's kind of pointing outwards as our third dimension. And we can sort of see how that relates to the idea of a corner that exists in actual three dimensions. In this case, we have our vertical axis coming upwards like this, and our horizontal axis going out, where our third dimension is perpendicular to that horizontal axis. Now we just have to be able to visualize the way that this diagram relates to an actual three-dimensional corner. Now what we can do to represent this vector on our axes is to put down each component separately on its own axis and then combine them at the end to make our final arrow. So say we have an x component that ends up right here, a y component that ends up here, and a z component all the way up here. What we can do is think about connecting the x and the y components at some point along the floor of our three axes down here, and then we can go upwards toward where our z should be. And if we draw all of these different parts together, the x and the y right here on the floor, the y and the z right here, and the x and the z over here, we can think about bringing them together just like this until we find the point where they converge. And this point right in the center here is going to be the endpoint of our vector. So rather than having this be a vector that's flat on the plane like this, we actually have a three-dimensional vector that goes up, out, and also inward like this down the x-axis. So this is our three-dimensional vector x, y, z. Now we're going to take a look at some of the basic properties of vectors. We'll start out by looking at vector addition. Say we have a vector a1, b1, and we want to add it to a2, b2, some other vector. Remember at the beginning we said that the components of a vector operate independently. So we can have x components and we can have y components, and they can interact with each other without really worrying about the other part. So in this case, when we're adding two vectors, we have an x component and an x component, and then we have a y and a y. 
And what we can do is add each of those parts separately. So when we do this vector addition, we'll end up with a1 plus a2, comma, b1 plus b2. And we can also represent this graphically. If we look at our two axes here, and we start out with a vector just like this, a1, b1, and then we add on a second vector here, a2, b2, let's think about what are the x and y components of the resulting vector that goes from the start of our first vector to the end of our second vector. That's going to be the sum of our two vectors. Let's take a look at the distances that are going on in this diagram. If we think about this first x distance from the origin to where our a1, b1 drops down to the horizontal axis, that's going to be the x component of our first vector, a1. And then if we think about the length from the tip of a1 all the way down to the tip of a2, in terms of the horizontal axis, that length is going to be a2. That's the horizontal component of our second vector. So if we look at the entire x distance that's going on here, it's going to be a1, this first stretch, plus a2. And we can do the same thing for the vertical axes. In this case, we're going to go up, and then we're going to go a little bit back down, which matches the negative component of our b2 here. So this is the way that we add vectors. We just have to look at adding their components since they are independent. The next operation we'll talk about is scalar multiplication. Now we've talked about having vectors a, b as things that have multiple components, but sometimes we want these to interact with stuff that has a single component. And when we have a single component, such as this number c, a number by itself is often called a scalar. And the reason for that is that it has the effect of scaling a vector. So let's take a look at what that looks like. If we wanted to look at 2 times the vector 3, 1, well, our vector 3, 1 is going to look something like this. So this is our 3, 1. And what happens is, if we multiply that by the scalar of 2, the reason it's called a scalar is because it's going to scale this vector up by a factor of 2. So this is our original vector, and this is what we have if it's scaled up so that it's 2 times as large. And if we do that out, we'll end up getting 6, 2 as our vector. But the reason we did that is because 2 times this vector is going to be the same as 2 times 3, 2 times 1. So we can bring the scalar in and multiply it by each of the individual components, again, because those components operate independently. So now that we're comfortable with vectors in terms of individual components, we can also think about them one different way. If we take a look at our three-dimensional vector here, we started out by thinking about it as x, y, and z all separate, and then we put them together spatially to get our arrow here. But we can also think about it from a different perspective. We can take this vector and say, this is an arrow that has a specific length and also a specific direction. If this vector were a different length or if it were pointing some other way, it would be a different vector and it would end up having different components as well. So one thing that's going to be useful for us is thinking about how we can figure out how long a vector is. That will determine the vector's magnitude or its length. Now if we want the magnitude of a two-dimensional vector, the answer is going to be pretty simple because we can always think about it in terms of a right triangle. If we're looking at our vector a, b here, the x component's going to be a, the y component's going to be b, and if we want to find the magnitude, that's going to be the length of our vector here, well, that's just going to be the hypotenuse of this right triangle. Remember, the x-axis is always perpendicular to the y-axis. So we've made a right triangle here, and we know by the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So if we want the magnitude of our vector a, b, we can just take the square root on both sides of this equation. So we get that the magnitude is the square root of a squared plus b squared, just like that. And we can actually extend this idea to when we're looking at three dimensions. Since we know how to find magnitude in two dimensions, let's try starting out by looking at a two-dimensional case. When we have this 3D vector, we know that it still has a specific x and y component. So if we take a look at that by itself, that's going to be this vector that's pointing along the floor here. What's the magnitude of this vector? Well, that's going to follow the formula that we just found. The magnitude of this vector here is going to be the square root of x squared 
plus y squared, just like that. Now we can take a look at another right triangle. If we start from this point on the floor and then go up to our final vector x, y, z, we actually have another right triangle because remember the z-axis is perpendicular to our floor here. So this angle right here is actually a right angle. And we can think about this triangle as kind of pointing out away from the board, just like that. So we have a right angle coming up. And that means that we can look at this right triangle in isolation as well. So if we do that, we'll have a right triangle that looks like this. The floor part is going to be the square root of x squared plus y squared. That's the length of our vector. And the vertical component is z. So if we want to find what's our hypotenuse, that's our final vector, the length of our final vector, we can use the Pythagorean theorem on what we have here. Our horizontal part squared is going to be x squared plus y squared, since we're canceling out that square root. Then we add on, our vertical component squared is z squared, and that's going to give us the magnitude of our final vector v squared. So if we want the magnitude of v, all we're going to have to do is take the square root on both sides. So this part here is the square root of x squared plus y squared and then plus z squared. So what we've done here is we've basically taken the two-dimensional version, our square root of a squared plus b squared, and just added our third dimension inside the square root right there. And that's going to generalize to however many dimensions you're looking at. Take all of the components, square them, and then put them inside that square root. By the Pythagorean theorem, that will give you the magnitude. Now one final thing I want to note is that there are a couple of different ways that we denote vectors in terms of their components. One way is the way that we talked about before using a notation like a comma b comma c inside of these angled brackets. But another way that we use sometimes when it's useful is we'll write it like this, a times i hat plus b times j hat plus c times k hat, just like this. Now what this means is that we're taking a and multiplying it by the x component vector. So we can think about this vector i being 1, 0, 0, and then j would be 0, 1, 0, and so on. The point here is that when we're looking at i, j, and k, it allows us to separate these different components and then add them together at the end. So sometimes we'll talk about i, j, and k if we want to separate the components and deal with them separately. 